Okay. So uh, it's 5.30. It looks like it's about time to start. So a uh, quick introduction. Uh, my name is Paul Matthews. I'm a system architect at uh, Bluehost. Um, and first off, let's do a quick, uh, quick survey. So how many people, how many people here use uh, RabbitMQ for their messaging system? Okay. Cupid? Okay. Anybody using ZeroMQ? Great. You guys don't really count because you, you're with us. So um, today we're going to talk about uh, going brokerless, the, uh, basically our transition from a Cupid-based system to a brokerless ZeroMQ-based system. Now, first off, um, RPC messaging, as most people know, is a critical component within any single OpenStack installation. Uh, the problem you're going to run into is very quickly, if your messaging system is not stable, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't scale with you as you continue to grow, you're going to run into major issues with the rest of your OpenStack installation. Uh, the reason why is because many of the core systems that OpenStack utilizes depend upon messaging to be reliable and to work at all times. Uh, if we look at some of the systems, for example, uh, compute, OpenStack compute uses messaging. If you, can't do, if you can't get reliable messaging across, you can't start instances, stop instances, reboot, anything like that. Uh, Solometer uses it. Cells use it. In fact, cells, uh, that is the only messaging system that you can use in your cells. Uh, VNC, neutron, conductor, and if our messaging system goes away, then, the, then all these systems cease to work properly for us. Um, and I know it's not just us that have RPC issues. Uh, for example, I was at uh, a Rackspace presentation yesterday where they were talking about their issues uh, with monitoring systems. They said one of their major systems that they had falling over was RabbitMQ and uh, how they dealt with it. So for us, we went with a Cupid solution in the first place. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, heck, why did you use Cupid? It seems like most people use RabbitMQ. Well, for us, we use, uh, we use CentOS and uh, Red, Red Hat based, uh, which means that uh, as a result, Red Hat packages up a lot of stuff for us um, that we just benefit from. Uh, one of these things is, of course, uh, Cupid. And because they package it up for us, we have a high degree of certainty that they're going to be stable, that they're going to be performance tested, that uh, the packages are going to work properly, that they're going to have security uh, patches backported for us. And that's a benefit that we can use. And a uh, second reason is uh, that Cupid offered the possibility of horizontal scaling. At the time, in uh, earlier versions of Cupid, they had a clustering module where you could have multiple Cupid servers acting in a highly available fashion. So you could have two or more servers that are highly available, and you could query any one of them and be able to get a response. Um, unfortunately, this feature was removed in point one of Cupid and is no longer available. So for us, um, our Cupid experience First off, we started with a single instance. And a single instance started to be problematic for us very quickly. Uh, we found out that around 3,000 to 5,000 nodes, it, uh, it started presenting problems for us. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, wait a second. You know, we have thousands of nodes. Uh, uh, Rackspace has tens of thousands of nodes. They're doing it just fine. Well, they're using cells. We have a single cell implementation. So we're not using cells to break anything up. Um, and what we found was is that that single instance of Cupid was not able to scale. We would have lots of problems where messages would fail to go through. Messages would be slow, and it caused major problems for us. Another issue that we found is that uh, Cupid connections to Nova Compute were lost. So the only thing that we could actually do to get this to fix itself was to restart 
the entire Nova Compute instance. And it, it seemed to be something with Eventlet where the message was not being picked up, processed properly. Uh, we never really investigated it very much at that time because we're, at that time, we were already moving on to uh, zero MQ. So a lot of people are gonna say, well, hang on a second. You guys use Cupid. A lot of people use RabbitMQ and have great success with it. Why didn't you go with RabbitMQ in the first place? Well, we, when we looked at RabbitMQ, we saw that it had the same brokered design as Cupid does, which kind of scared us away a little bit. Uh, because the broker model has a lot of drawbacks. You have a single point of failure, you have a single point where all your messages have to go through, and as a result, that one piece has to be able to scale. And we'd also talked to other members in the community who reported many of the same problems with their own Rabbit, RabbitMQ installation, and as a result, we looked at other things. Now, there are a couple possible solutions that the community has to scale a broker. Uh, first off is cells, and the second is using uh, clustering or high availability. Now, first off is cells. The biggest problem with cells, the one biggest problem is they do not directly address any of the performance issues with anything. Scheduler, uh, MySQL, messaging, nothing. All they do is they are, it breaks up your installation into smaller pieces. And also, cells have a major issue in that if you're using cells, if I have an instance in this one child cell, let's say I want to move it over to this one. Can't do that with cells. And we did not feel that's, uh, we didn't want to be bootstrapped by limitations that cells had. Um, and one of the other things is because of the way that brokers are implemented where they pass messages from one down to the other, they chain services, it can magnify problems as they occur. So for instance, if we have this child cell he, and we send a message from our API cell down to this grandchild cell, if any issue happens here on our child cell, the grandchild cell is also gone as well. We can't get any messages through to them. Now on clustering, uh, as I mentioned, we started out with a uh, sing single uh, Cupid instance. We moved on to a clustered solution. Uh, what we found is clustering is extremely slow, extremely unreliable. As you actually add nodes, you actually lose performance. You don't gain it. Um, the second thing is, is we actually using a clustered solution with Cupid we actually saw more problems than we did, than we did with a single, single instance. Uh, lots of times we would look at the instance during the day, uh, we'd have messaging problems. You go look at the cluster and what would be happening is one of the clusters had fallen out, was resyncing, for whatever reason it had problems. And during that time, messages are not reliably passed from one machine to the other, they're not reliably responded to or not responded to at all. Another thing was is that we could never get, if we added a node, if we ever tried to add a node into the cluster while it was actually in operation, that one node would never, ever sync up. Now, if we added, so basically what we had in that solution, in that instance, is we had to take an outage late at night, take the entire cluster down, and bring the entire cluster back up so it would actually sync while we turned off keep its messaging services. Um, now, as far as RabbitMQ goes with clustering, it does have a highly available solution, but the problem is, is it's extremely complicated. Uh, you have to have shared storage, something like DRDB, Pacemaker, uh, Heartbeat, Chorusync, to make sure that everything works properly. There's, just, it, there's a lot of moving pieces that can cause problems. Um, so not only do you have to make sure your st shared storage works, but if everything is working properly, you also have to make sure that when you fail from one node to the other, does Pacemaker or whatever solution you implement, does it actually fail over gracefully and not break? And the bottom line is, is we found that scaling a broker is not 
actually a practical solution. So what do you do? Well, we decided to throw out the broker. Brokers don't actually scale. They're a single point of failure that everything has to pass through. And so we needed a new solution that would work for us. And we had a couple of requirements. First off, we had to have no single point of failure. We didn't have to be dependent, we didn't want to be dependent on a single cluster of nodes, a single service for our entire OpenStack installation to work. We needed our, the solution we implemented to be something that was horizontally scalable. So as we continued to grow and scale our installation, it would continue to grow and scale with us. And it also had to be reliable for us. So we moved on, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we moved to ZeroMQ. Uh, and ZeroMQ has no centralized broker. It's more of a peer-to-peer -peer distributed system. Basically what you're essentially doing is you're moving your installation from a single broker on a single box to brokers on every single machine. Every single machine at that point gets a ZeroMQ receiver, which will actually receive the message for messages that are passed to it from other nodes. Um, now, a lot of people are gonna say, hang on a second. This doesn't sound like a good solution. I don't wanna have to have all my nodes knowing where everything is. It's, you know, I like the idea of having just one instance where everything goes to. So I just have a Cupid host. Well, ZeroMQ handles this very gracefully. It has a matchmaker file, which I have a little example of here. If you look, we have two queues. We have the scheduler and console auth, and then a couple of hosts that are defined. And the matchmaker is able to pass through, if you get a request for the scheduler, it passes it through to one of those hosts. So as far as messaging topologies goes, if we look at Cupid or RabbitMQ, basically a broker-based solution, you have a star topology, where you have a broker in the center and all of your nodes have to pass messages through it. So not only do you have a single point of failure, but also you have an issue where any messages that have to go through have to pass through your broker. ZeroMQ, on the other hand, is a partially connected mesh. Now I say partially connected mesh because nodes only communicate with the other endpoints that they're going to talk to. So for instance, a compute node in the current implementation can't pass a message to another compute node then off to the API or whatever else. Now this could be easily implemented uh, because of the way that ZeroMQ is written, but as it is, it's a partially connected mesh. Now, as I mentioned, um, ZeroMQ, we could program this in. ZeroMQ has a lot of flexibility inherent in its design. Uh, brokers on one hand have a very inflexible design. You have uh, exchanges, queues, fan outs, subscriptions, and there's not a whole lot you can do with that. If you look at ZeroMQ on the other hand, you have four simple methods. Connect, bind, send, and receive. And with those four methods, we can therefore basically implement any kind of messaging topology that we want. And because ZeroMQ is so simple, it uses uh, lightweight sockets, the resource utilization is extremely low. And as a result, we're also able to pass a lot more messages through at any time. So I did a little uh, benchmark testing of ZeroMQ uh, versus Cupid and Rabbit on a single core VM. Um, and as you can see, this is uh, the number of casts per second. More here is better. Um, and as you can see, ZeroMQ, uh, I guess it's not very well uh, shown here, but ZeroMQ is almost three times as fast as RabbitMQ. Now another thing to keep in mind here is RabbitMQ and Cupid are, because they're brokered solutions, this is the maximum number of messages that they're going to pass through the system at any given time. ZeroMQ, on the other hand, you're passing messages from host to host. So that's the maximum amount of casts you could pass from one host to another, but that is not the capacity of your entire system because it's distributed. Now, people are gonna say, great, ZeroMQ sounds wonderful, how do I use it? Well, all you really have to do is, first off, obviously change your RPC backend to use ZeroMQ. 
The next thing you need to do is uh, ZeroMQ has several different matchmaker capabilities that it has. In most cases, we're going to want to use matchmaker ring. The reason why is because matchmaker ring, it actually, so for example, in this matchmaker file, same one as we used before, sets up a hash relationship between the queue and the machines defined in it. So if we have a message that passes to the scheduler, the matchmaker file will return one of these hosts. Um, once that's configured, all we have to do is start the ZMQ receiver, restart uh, Nova Compute or whatever service is on the controller, and we're good to go. Now, as far as uh, a migration process goes, we're kind of bootstrapped because of Nova's configuration. Because we can only have a single backend at any given time, unless we have some way of breaking up our installation, unless we have some kind of logical division, there's not a good way that we can change from one, one RPC system to another. As a result, we needed a new solution. Uh, as I mentioned before, we moved from a single qubit cluster, or from a single qubit instance to a qubit cluster. Uh, the way we did that is we set up another group of compute nodes, and we would move nodes from one group of compute nodes to the next. Now, obviously, this is not an optimal solution. It means that it's very complicated for us to move nodes, leaves a lot of room for corruption, and it's, it's very complex. We really have to make sure that everything goes through properly. And it's not something that we wanted to go through again. We needed something where we could... Well, obviously, at the time, we had grown from about 5,000 nodes to tens of thousands of nodes. And in our particular case, where we're a budget hosting provider, uh, these are all customer instances. Any impacts in messaging are noticed by them and are not, are not good for our uh, credibility. So we needed to find a way to migrate these instances from one messaging system to the next with little or no downtime. And we needed to be able to do this in a slow roll fashion. So we could roll it to small number of machines at any given time, make sure that they were working, and then expand that out as we gained confidence in it. So we started working on code, looking in Nova, and what we came up with is dual messaging backends. So what actually happens in this is that nodes concurrently connect to both Cupid and RabbitMQ backends and can use either one depending on which messaging system they receive a message on. Um, it means that we can roll out the code uh, separate from the actual configuration. So we can roll out the code and enable the configuration at a later time. Um, and once we enable it, either messaging backend system can be used. Now I could probably sit up here and talk to you about how this works for the entire 40 minutes and a lot of people would probably never catch on to how it actually works. So I figured the best way to do it would be a more graphical representation. So let's say this here is a graphical rep representation of our OpenStack installation. So first thing, we roll out all the, all the code to all these machines. Next, we deploy our configuration to our controller nodes. We deploy that out, uh, start ZMQ receiver, and restart the services on the controllers. Now what happens is a message comes in to go to Compute 1. Now obviously, Compute 1, as you can see, is not running ZMQ just the controller is. Now, the way that we determine how we're going to broadcast this message via ZMQ or Cupid, the first thing we do is we check to see if the ZMQ receiver is listening on port 9501 of the compute node. We find out that it's not, and so we broadcast that message via Cupid. No problem. So next thing, we decide we need to roll this out to some of our compute nodes. So we roll out the configuration, start the ZMQ receiver, now a message comes in for the second compute node. The first thing the controller does is says, hey, is that receiver listening? In this case, yes, he is. And so we broadcast that message out. Now, a lot of people are going to say, well, hang on a sec. I have a poor CMS system. Or let's say, for whatever reason, I want some of my controllers to run Cupid or Rabbit, for whatever reason, and the other ones to run ZeroMQ. Well, that's no problem. Uh, so let's say we have a, another 
controller node here that has a broken configuration system or for whatever reason we want it to run Cupid. If it sends a message out to Compute2, which is running a ZMQ receiver, that uh, Compute2 will respond via Cupid. So whatever messaging system the message comes in on is which messaging system it will be responded to on. So the actual configuration of the dual backends is very simple. Basically the only configuration switch we use in, in the code is if the RPC backend is configured as zero MQ, then the dual backends are enabled. Now obviously this code could be prettied up and have a configuration option. It would be relatively easy to implement. It was just something simple for us to implement and so it's not totally clean, but it can be cleaned up very easily. Um, anyway, so the only other thing you have to, besides implementing zero MQ, is you have to make sure that your Cupid host name is there. It's not gonna affect anything. All it means is that the hosts actually have a backend to be able to connect to for their broker. Um, and again, once those nodes are switched over, they'll respond to whichever message that, uh, whichever backend the message came in on. Now as far as our, migra our migration to ZeroMQ, um, the dual backend code for us obviously meant we had minimal downtime. All we had to do was configure, uh, change the configuration, restart the services, and we're up and going. Um, the actual migration for us was very smooth. There weren't any major uh, issues with rolling it out. Uh, we didn't have any major message outages. And uh, the, a lot of people are gonna wonder about the connection checks between zero MQ and the remote nodes, whether that's gonna cause any noticeable load. We didn't notice any. And honestly, the first thing we did was we rolled out the code to the compute nodes, so those compute nodes were doing ZMQ connection checks to every single node all the time. Um, and we saw no noticeable issues. Uh, as far as zero MQ in production, now that we're using it, it's a lot better than Cupid, or, than Cupid was for us. It works wonderfully. Um, it's more reliable for us. We're not losing messages all the time anymore. Um, it's a lot faster and allows us to, it's allowed us to scale our OpenStack installation further than we were before. Now I wish that I could say that there were no issues with anything, that uh, we had dancing unicorns and rainbows in our data center, but Unfortunately, I can't say that. There are still some lingering issues with moving to zero MQ. Um, the one issue that we are seeing, and fortunately it's very rare, it doesn't happen very often, is that the ZMQ receiver receives a message, processes it, but Nova actually doesn't, doesn't consume it. Now, uh, in talking to uh, some of the developers at, at the uh, conference here, we think we may have, uh, have uh, found the issue. Um, it may be related to a bug that uh, is known and has a fix for it, but has never been pushed up to uh, mainline. So hopefully that's fixed for us and that would be wonderful. Um, we don't really know that yet though. So a lot of people are gonna be wanting to switch over to ZeroMQ possibly, uh, wanting to look at this code. So there it is. There's a link on GitHub. You can go ahead and use it. and. Uh, Finally, any, any questions? Don't. Uh, do we notice any, any issues with the ZMQ driver? None that we have seen. I mean, as I say, it's, it, it works for us. It works a lot better than Cupid ever did. It's a lot of to scale our installation and we haven't noticed any any larger issues than there were on Cupid? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. So the question is, uh, as far as the dual backend code. Um, after it's, after it's uh, no longer needed, can you switch back? And the answer is yes. 
Um, basically, it's only something that you need during the transition period. Once you've switched over, then you can just switch over to pure zero MQ and you're done. You don't need to keep it any longer. Or obviously you can retain it. I mean, during our, during our transition phase, it didn't cause any issues. So I wouldn't see any issues with uh, maintaining it in production, but. So how does it what? How does zero MQ work with Redis? How does it? Redis, it's a NoSQL um, database. Mm -hmm. So currently, Nova Compute and Nova, there is a matchmaker. Mm -hmm. uh, Redis, because I, I face, um, I face a lot of installation issues for, uh, with zero MQ and Redis. So I'm going mm -hmm. to that. Um, as, now the question was uh, with Redis and zero MQ. Um, now I know there is a Redis backend that you can use. Um, we just use the matchmaker file, which is just, just JSON. So no issues there. I, I, I can't really address that because we, we didn't use it. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yes, go ahead. Which what? Which tool did we use for what? Um, basically, I just monitored how many messages were being passed through. <laughs> I mean, no, nothing complex. Uh, those were against Folsom. So, all right, it looks like we're out of time. So thank you very much.